Welcome to the Paradise Paradox. So a few months ago, I was in Thailand and I had the pleasure and the opportunity of staying in the temple of Wat Tham Krabok and interviewing my friend who is a monk there. So Wat Tham Krabok has an interesting reputation because of their drug detoxification program that they have there, which is especially for opiate addicts. And a few years ago, Vice released a piece saying it was the harshest drug detox program in the world. So that comes up in the interview and it turns out it's not quite as harsh as they made it out. We also talk about the founding of the temple, about the founders Luang Po Yai and her two nephews, and also about the medicine, the herbal medicine that they use there, which is actually literally vomit inducing. And I had the, the chance to try that there as well. And we talk about Buddhism in general and the teachings of Buddhism, how it can be used, this, this approach, which can reduce the suffering in, in people's lives. So it's a great interview. It's actually the first part. I've got a, a lot more footage of this, and which I'll release over the coming weeks. Unfortunately, the audio had a few problems. So I did dub over some of the bits that were harder to hear. So you'll hear my voice in some places where it should be my friends. So let's get into it. my friend and he's going to tell us a bit about Wat Tham Krabok, the temple here in Thailand near uh, Praputapat in Saraburi province. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, pretty good. So this is an unusual Buddhist temple because it's, it's kind of got a, a separate tradition in, in a sense to most of the temples in Thailand. Yeah, so uh, Buddhism in Thailand is uh, interesting just as a broad picture of what Buddhism is like. Uh, there are a lot of forest traditions that have survived uh, up to this day. Uh, early in the last century, there was a kind of reformation in Thailand and they tried to uh, standardize, I guess, the practice of Buddhism. Uh, across a lot of temples, but there are still a lot of traditions which are very uh, unique. And this temple comes out of that wandering in the forest monk tradition. So a lot of the style of practice here is is quite unique, and even the uh, ritualism involved in living in this temple is very different than in other temples. But fundamentally, the, I guess the, the underlying basis of the practice is the same. Buddhism is the same uh, all around the world. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different varieties and styles of practice, but at the end of the day, it has a common goal of uh, eradication of suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so it is it is a little different, but not not that different. The fundamentals are the same. Yeah. I think yeah. So. Hmm. so, can you tell us, like, uh, about the, about the founder of the temple, about the Luang Por? Yeah. I don't know if I can. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, I guess what we would call biographical details are not commonly discussed amongst people. Hmm. Uh, the, the feeling of one of the other founders was that it's her life is kind of sacred, so hmm. to turn it into like a story, like a biographical story, is not really respecting the nature of what she was as a hmm. being. Yeah, it's a bit funny. Right. So, uh, though, can I say some, some basic details? Like, like about... You can say. I can say it, but you can't. Okay, all right, fair enough. Because uh, <laughs> I guess there's a lot of rumors floating around as well, but, so I have to be careful. I don't want to overstep, you know, the bounds. But uh, she was... Um, she ordained herself as, as a monk, uh, which is unusual um, because she, it wasn't a title given to her, but she, she took 
Tibet herself. And of course, female monks are, are not common. She decided she wanted to be, wanted to be a, a monk and not a nun. And she, they say she foresaw or pr predicted uh, that drug abuse was going to be a problem in Thailand. And uh, that was one of the main reasons she, she set up this temple. And uh, some of the practices here, like the, the medicine, the, the herbal remedies that they use, like the herbal tea and the emetics, that is the, the vomiting medicine. So uh, I, guess, <laughs> I guess I can't get you to comment on that so, to affirm or deny it. But, Here my friend said, well, the interesting thing about this place is that we're not trying to find one story or one history. One story or one history. Hmm. One, I know we call it one plumb line of, of the way things are or the way things work. Hmm. Um, if you talk to different high monks, uh, different monks have been living here for 40, 50 years or whatever, they will all have different stories. Some of them are radically contradictory. Here my friend said that his teacher told him that Luang Po Yai was a nun. But the story of her ordaining herself is also quite accepted, and the story of her being a monk is also accepted. Again, there's a strange thing about Buddhism, like there's a certain picture and ordination has a certain meaning in this and that. As far as we understand the history of the Buddha. When Buddha was ordaining monks early on, ordination was just, okay, you're a monk, get to it. It wasn't this big ritualistic thing. So a lot of problems that people have with this and a lot of questions stem from the different way that we approach ritualism to other contemporary styles of Buddhism. Hmm. Uh, but in the tradition itself, throughout the history of the path, which is more than half thousand years, there have been all of these changes and all of these different styles of ritualism from the early non-ritual way of practicing all the way up to the intensely codified ritual practices of what Tibetan Buddhism is highly ritualistic. Yeah, so I don't know, this question of what the status was in terms of ordination to me is, is interesting. I kind of like the idea of someone just ordaining himself. Uh, but at the same time, from the, I guess, contemporary historical way of looking at events, uh, it's really hard to say anything about this place. Hmm. If you ask questions about when something was built or why it was built or what it's for, again, you'll get these answers that are, to some degree, uh, contradictory or conflicting or whatever. In Thailand, that's not an issue. It's not like there is a truth and everything else is false. It's like uh, they accept. They accept wholeheartedly partial truths. Trying to peel things back to get to a true story isn't really important in Thai culture. Right. Yeah, fair enough. So it's much like with the Buddha himself. Like people, people will tell parables about the Buddha, and the details will change depending on what the moral of the story is. And that's just fine. Yeah. I mean, again, with the Buddha, maybe there's more of a uh, classically accepted canonical version of his life. But even that is shrouded in like legendary aspects and magical aspects. Uh, for a lot of people, if they, they were to read the, the official story of Buddha's life, it would have a lot of things in it that would defy common understanding of physical So, yeah, again, that, as to what that means, or the significance of it, yeah, it depends on who's looking or thinking about it. Yes, yes. So, it's so, like, uh, as well, like with Christianity, like, I, I know you mentioned this, this story about um, Jesus uh, handing out the fish and the bread to people. Some people will take that literally as a miracle and other people will say, well, when we share, we, we get more. So it's, it's up to your interpretation. Uh, but in terms of the founders of the temple, so there's Rongbuyai and then these two 
brothers in Porsche right now, which I'm hmm. All three of them are good and then, um, like super normal hmm. Yeah, so again, a lot of the stories about them are kept a little bit inside because, uh, yeah, like either people will, I guess, put too much uh, stock in miraculous, magical kind of things or they will become very skeptical and very dubious about um, a place that yeah, refers to these stories that again uh, conventional way of looking at physical reality seem uh, like children's stories or something. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just yeah, part of the contradiction and, and uh, you know, you just get on with it. I guess digging up the past isn't necessarily so important. Yeah, I mean you can you can use it as a model, you can use it to learn from, to uh, yeah, create a kind of triangula triangulation with the present. Yeah, but other than that, uh, yeah, it's not, not so relevant to daily practice. It's here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, can you tell me about um, the detox and how the detox works? Like, there's this Vice article, and the, the title of the article is deliberately sensational. They say it's the, the world's toughest rehab center. And I read the article, and I'm like, they, they tack that, that, that title on later. Um, <laughs> the article doesn't really align with what, what they're saying. Um, but tell us about what, what they do in the detox, how it comes. So, I don't know where to start. So the detox has been running for a long time. Uh, it kind of started organically because uh, the Kingdom of Thailand made uh, opium and heroin illegal. Mm. So uh, up until a certain point, now maybe 40 years ago, no, probably more than that, maybe almost 60 years ago now, uh, uh, opioids became illegal in Thailand. So there are a whole bunch of people who um, wanted to follow the law, had to withdraw from opioids. So it, the detox kind of started organically in a sense. Uh, like two brothers were living in the cave where the temple started. Uh, there was someone addicted to opium who wanted their help. And they didn't really want to help him. <laughs> Just like, you know, we're practicing here, go, go away. Um, doing some serious um, meditation practice. And but he just kept coming back and there's a tradition that if someone asks you to do something three times and you know, it works not and it won't uh, cause any negative effects, we kind of obliged to do it. Uh, so they said, okay, uh, you can just stay here with us. And then so that's how the detox started. It's just somebody asked them for help and they, uh, they decided they could help them just by having them stay with them. Uh, and the medicine, and again, this is legend, but uh, the medicine started. Uh, I saw a, a sick cat, and the, the cat went in and ate from this particular plant. And as soon as it ate the plant, it started throwing up. And then, through by its behavior, I guess you could tell that it was feeling better. So, this is the original, this is the legend of the story of how the vomiting medicine was created. So, then she took this plant and combined it with a whole bunch of other plants. Uh, Thailand has a very strong tradition in so the idea was to create a herbal medicine that would suit every different kind of constitutional type. Mm. So there are, again, it's maybe a bit legendary, but uh, officially there are 108 different herbs in this um, medicine, uh, which have been put together through some kind of naturalistic inspiration, uh, but also with um, traditional herbal law to create this medicine that, uh, yeah, that will help uh, every kind of constitutional person. So uh, that's the medicine, uh, but also uh, so the, the two brothers, they, they had this idea that Buddhist monks should also take care of uh, social problems. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't want to be the kind of monks who just sit in the forest and uh, work for their own uh, freedom and, and disregard the greater community at large. So they got together and with, with these predictions that Bukhari I made about the future problems of Thailand, uh, one brother decided that he would um, help people with uh, drug problems. And the other brother decided that he would help uh, the 
youth um, in literacy and basic education and so on. So uh, he traveled around Todd and stuff all of these different schools to help people learn to read and learn to find and uh, also raise the basic level of education for children. I don't know if comparing different detoxes is, is particularly useful or, or uh, even means anything. Mm. Um, a detox is not harder or easier than another detox, like detoxing is detoxing. Um, maybe this place is, is harder in a sense in terms of creature comforts, uh, because inside the detox is, is very sparse and um, the people live in dormitories there isn't much in the way of, of creature comforts and the detox process is not um, uh, mitigated by other drugs. So normally in conventional detox, especially in the West, there's a whole bunch of uh, substitution that happens between drugs and for other drugs. And the basic idea is to control the symptoms of the detox while the person with the detox applies. Uh, but here there's no symptom control whatsoever. Can't take any kind of pharmaceutical drugs or anything like that. So there's nothing to help you sleep, there's nothing to help you with your digestion, there's nothing to help you with pain, which is, I think, one of the reasons why the detox here is uh, so effective. It, if it is hard, I think that hardness is useful because it makes people uh, resilient or it gets them back in touch with their own resilience. Uh, one of the things that happens with people who use a lot of drugs is they, they lose the ability to suffer through things uh, because they have this convenient escape from pain, from emotional pain, from uh, being awake. So People just get in this habit of not facing their own experience, their own pain, their own minute-to-minute -minute reality. reality. So in the so detox here, there's nothing they can use to distract themselves. There's a TV in there right now. Uh, so, uh, and it's only Thai TV anyway, so the foreign nations is not so useful a distraction tool. Uh, but there's no recorded music, there's no uh, telephones or anything. There are little periods during the week where you can go and talk to your family or friends or whatever, or use the internet for an hour or something. Um, just so you can stay in touch with the world. Uh, but yeah, you're really you're just sitting inside of your own experience. Um, these medications are not designed to help you with your symptoms at all. They're just designed to cleanse your body. We have the herbal steam bath as well, which cleanses toxins through the skin, helps them detoxify. Other than that, it's just sitting with their experience, which is a really strange kind of sideways way of practicing getting people to look at their experiences in what we'd call Buddhist terms. Buddhism isn't really, it isn't really a thing. It's more of an approach to the nature of life. I'm trying to understand your own suffering. And one of the important truths in Buddhism is that uh, what you crave or what you desire causes suffering. And for a lot of people in the world, this truth is a bit hard to see because you want something and then you get what you want and you have a bit of joy or something from it. If you line up a whole series of these, you can kind of feel like you're happy and you don't have kind of suffering. Uh, but for a drug addict, the idea that craving causes suffering is an absolute truth that every drug addict has experienced hundreds of times, thousands of times. Um, getting what you want doesn't satisfy you. Um, yeah, the, the whole cycle of craving is really, really the cycle of, this, the cycle of drug abuse, but just amped up. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's a lot easier I think, for people who have been drug addicts to see uh, some of the truths about what craving does and what desire does. And um, the, the standard approach to satisfaction and happiness um, that the world presents to us doesn't really work. Um, I, I made a play about um, a drug addict a little while ago and um, he had all of these 
she can already arguments about um, drug abuse being a kind of uh, form of progress, like the progress of civilization, because we have control of these technologies. Um, chem chemistry is a kind of technology. Uh, why shouldn't we use uh, chemical technologies to make our lives better, to make ourselves feel better, to make mm. ourselves happy? Mm. Uh, but it's really a spurious argument. There are these deeper truths that are easier to touch once you've seen the, the devastation that happens from, uh, from desire and craving. Mm. So that's like Eckhart Tolle talks about the, the way of the cross, like hitting absolute rock bottom, and that's when you start to realize that just going after your desires is, isn't what it's cranked up to be. Yeah, Fight Club is a similar thing. Right. Hitting <laughs> yeah, and sometimes it's it's necessary. Uh, like, to, if if you want to if you want to change your life, you need motivation to change it. If you think you're okay, you can kind of make do. It's hard to make a big change, a change in your perspective, a change in your direction. When you realize, oh, if I keep going this direction, I'm gonna die. If I keep going this direction. things that can become the impetus for, for change and for self-discovery, for 